Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, one of the most popular videos I've done for a while now, uh, it, other than oversimplified, of course, uh, has been uh, the video we did to this channel, Top 10, so with Simon Whistler, uh, taking a look at some myths that people believe because of Hollywood uh, about World War II. And so this is another one of those along the lines of looking at myths or uh, things that people don't really talk a lot about or acknowledge or even know. Uh, this one is 10 Uncomfortable Truths About the American Revolution. I have not watched the video yet, though I did kind of scan the chapters a little bit to see what it was about. Uh, and I think they all sound pretty solid and well-researched, and I think I'll probably agree with the big idea behind each one. Uh, so like I did with the last Top 10s video we looked at, I will allow him to talk about the entire thing of each one, and then we'll pause and break it down a little bit, give you a little more context, talk about whether I even agree with it or not, uh, and we'll go from there. I'll put the link down in the description if you want to check it out without my commentary. Uh, this is another video that I am recording ahead of time as I am off to the UK today. Looking forward to meeting a bunch of you while I'm there. Let's go ahead and dive in. Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the Top 10 Uncomfortable Truths about the American Revolution. The American Revolution and the Founding Fathers are practically deified in modern America, and many of the greatest figures True. from the period have been made into almost demigods of American myth and legend. However, the truth is that much of the reasoning for the revolution wasn't as pure as the history books make it 100%. out to be. And while it may be insanely popular now, the common man back in the day more or less was less than enthused one way or the other about it all. The American Revolution may have been the greatest triumph for early America, but things were not always what they seemed, and the Americans could not have achieved it without a lot of outside help. Yeah, and it's, it's important to point out before he even gets into this today that recognize that uh, things didn't happen back then the way they happen now in terms of, you know, for example, we vote for our president now. We vote for our members of Congress now. Uh, it wasn't quite like that at the time. These people who were making these decisions, the people in the Continental Congress who voted for independence, who made George Washington the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, these were people who many of them were selected by an assembly back home. Uh, and yes, some people had a say in who those members of those assemblies were that chose these delegates to the Congress. But it's not like everybody was voting. A very select elite few had a say in all of that. So the common farmer working his fields in South Carolina had very little to do with the, the goings on of the revolution. Now, a lot of those guys did enlist to fight, but many of them also uh, enlisted in militia to fight for the, the crown. Number 10. George Washington was hardly a singular military genius. He wasn't even a good George general. Washington is probably the most popular and non-controversial American in history, and for very good reason. He presided over the revolutionary forces as they sought freedom from Britain. He managed to keep up the morale of his men throughout extreme adversity. He pulled off a couple of very clever sneak attacks, and overall managed to ingratiate himself so much with the people that they practically begged him to be president afterwards. Indeed, many people were disappointed when he did not seek a third term, setting a precedent that would last until it was finally broken by the Roosevelt family with an attempt, and then finally with a success at winning a third term in office. However, while today most people in the United States consider him one of the greatest military minds of all time, many historians actually beg to differ. The truth is that George Washington lost way more battles than he won, and he spent most of his time running away from fights. His most famous victory, the crossing of the Delaware, was a sneak attack that would have failed if not for a British commander disregarding a warning notice. Indeed, his most famous victory was a combination of luck and enemy ineptitude. George Washington did a good job of keeping up morale and setting an example for the entire country, and he was very good at keeping his army from being pinned down or captured. However, the real credit for the genius military maneuvers in most historians' minds goes to generals like Nathaniel Greene, without whom the war effort would have likely been totally lost. Number nine. Yeah, so I've said this before, I'll say it again. George Washington was not a good general. Like, even if you had given him equal numbers on the field and equal supplies and equal 
opportunities, he probably will lose in a pitched battle. That was not his strength. George Washington's strength was in leadership. Now, leadership is different than tactical and strategic um ability on the battlefield he got outsmarted on the battlefield time and time again but he was a phenomenal leader of men he could inspire people he held the th this thing together when i don't know that anyone else could have he could recognize greatness in others it was george washington who recognized nathaniel green's greatness as a general it was george washington who saw the brilliance of alexander hamilton uh and and others uh you know he had a lot of people coming to him uh, with letters of recommendation from Europe, uh, and most of them he turned away, but the ones that he did accept, people like Baron von Steuben, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, these were intelligent, capable people who really did good things, and he put them in positions to be successful. He was very good at managing personalities, at keeping his own ego in check many times, um, had a bit of a uh, of a temper problem that he did a pretty good job of keeping in check. Uh, so I'm not sure that anyone else could have successfully led the revolution, but it's not because he was a good general. He had a lot of other qualities that made him the perfect person for that job. The British were spread incredibly thin, and the Americans still needed help from their strongest enemies. The American Revolution is looked upon with great pride by most Americans, so it really is easy for Americans to play up their own part and forget how close things really were, or just how much of a team effort it really was. The truth was that, at the time, the colonies were fighting for independence, and the British Empire, or as usual for the time, had their fingers in every pie imaginable. They were, in one way or another, irking their other powerful neighbors in Europe, and so it was in this atmosphere that the colonists managed to wrest control of their lives from the British crown. The French were the biggest key of all here, and the naval help they provided simply cannot be underestimated. Amen. Without French naval blockades of key areas, and also French naval support against the far superior British Navy, the Americans simply wouldn't have been able to get the revolution off the ground. The Spanish also played a very big part yep. by having a second war front against the British. This spread them even thinner, and it made it harder for them to focus all of their energies on their colonies, especially in America. Much of the support that came from Europe for America was negotiated very very carefully by Benjamin Franklin, whose deals in Paris may have single-handedly tipped the balance to win the colonies their freedom. Number yeah, so there's a movie coming out, uh, or is it a TV series? Um, it's coming out in April on Apple TV, uh, starring Michael Douglas as Benjamin Franklin, and it focuses on Franklin's efforts to negotiate the alliance with the French. Um, so interesting. It'll be pretty cool to see that. And I know that Michael Douglas's son, Dylan, is a fan of this channel. So, hey, Dylan, if you're watching, excited to see your dad in that one. Um, yeah, uh, without France, America doesn't exist, period. So we can make fun of the French all we want, call them surrenderers and losers and everything because of what happened in World War II. But listen, we do not exist without the French. And people used to recognize that. Uh, so much so that when the United States for the very first time gets involved in a European war, which is World War I in 1917, there's this big parade that happens uh, where uh, the initial group of American expeditionary forces who arrive in Paris march through the streets. They go to Lafayette's grave at the Picpus Cemetery in uh, Paris. And this colonel named Stanton, it was not Pershing, it was Stanton. Pershing was there, gives this speech where he talks about how America honors her debts. And then he ends the speech by saying, Lafayette, we are here. Because Lafayette is the Frenchman who becomes an American major general, who is also key in helping negotiate getting French support. He goes back to France at one point during the Revolution to help with all this. And Hamilton does the song Guns and Ships, where Lafayette talks about how he goes to France and he comes back with more gun. I go to France for more funds, I come back with more guns and ships. And so the balance shifts. Without the French Navy, without the French finances, like he said, without the Spanish opening up a front fighting over Gibraltar and other places in Europe, without money from the Dutch, 
this does not happen. And that's the main difference between the American Revolution and, say, the U.S. Civil War, because the South didn't get that European support that they would have needed. Otherwise, the South really was in a stronger position to win than the Americans ever were in the 1770s. The difference is they didn't get the support. Great. The American Revolution was not nearly as popular at home as you might think. The American Revolution today is probably the most well-regarded historical event in the history of the United States, and you couldn't possibly find a person alive in the country who would criticize it. For this reason, especially due to the very exuberant history that most Americans read, most of them figure that people were just itching to get out and fight for the cause of freedom. Nope. However, the truth is that things were almost entirely the opposite. Now, when the war first broke out, there was quite a rush of volunteers, but the enthusiasm it didn't last very long. Life as a soldier is grim and it's brutal, and many of them had farms back at home that they were afraid would languish and fall into ruin if they weren't around to tend to them. As the war started to drag on, Washington despaired of getting enough men by voluntary enlistment and started suggesting that Congress instate a compulsory draft. While Congress did not instate this nationally, many of the fledgling states were already flexing their muscles to force people to join if enlistment quotas were not being met. However, lots of cash bounties were also also offered including land offers to sweeten the pot, as many soldiers admitted they only joined for the big payout as they saw it as a way to move up economically. Also, yep. there were still many British loyalists, known as Tories, living in the country, and they were not interested in fighting against the Crown that they still had sentiment for. The fight for freedom from England would mostly benefit rich landowners, so your average poorer loyalist would have little reason to take up arms against his old homeland. Number seven. All 100% true, what he just said. Uh, a couple of things here. Number one, when the war breaks out in 1775 in April, it's primarily a New England problem, and most of the militias that are there are going to be New England. You start to get help from the central and southern states in the form of like George Washington showing up, and he starts kind of pushing for raising people from Virginia to come help. Uh, but even in the, in the Continental Congress, the, the majority opinion at that point was still reconciliation. It was still, how do we fix this? How do we just get what it is that we want from the crown? And if, if the king and parliament had come in in the fall of 1775, when the Continental Army is besieging Boston and the war is in its early stages, if the king and the parliament had said, you know what? We're going to give you representation in parliament. We're going to hear your grievances. We're going to withdraw the troops. There's no independence. They would have been all for that. That was absolutely what they were after. It was only as things con continued down that path and as uh, the king and parliament kind of thumbed their noses at any attempts by uh, the Continental Congress to reconcile that they finally went down the road of independence. And he's absolutely right. Uh, most of these guys, they were farmers, they were militia. Most of the people who fought in the revolution did not join and fight for seven years. If you look at a lot of the pensions for these guys who, who filed for pensions in the 1830s and 1840s, who were old men by this point, and they talk about their service. They're like, well, I served for three months in 1777, and I served for two months, two different times in 1778, and I served for four months in 1780. Because uh, they, they would come, they would join for a couple of months, they would go back home, tend their farms, deal with everything, and then they might enlist in another militia unit for a few months that got raised. That was pretty much how most of these guys fought. And they weren't getting paid, and they weren't adequately supplied or fed. And a lot of them just went home and there were mutinies that happened. And the promise of land was a big, big deal. And the promise of land was only going to come through if they won, because a lot of that land was in places like Kentucky and Ohio and Tennessee, places that treaty bound Britain was not allowed to send settlers into. But when they won, they were able to start taking that land. Seven. The Revolutionary War was basically a proxy war between France and Great Britain. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Revolutionary Kinda. War had a great deal of involvement from France, who supplied a lot of naval and other support that helped give the United States far more than just a fighting chance. However, it really requires an explanation to get the full extent of it here. The truth is that the French weren't just there to help the Americans out. They had essentially created a proxy war between themselves and the English right on American soil. And just like other proxy wars you see today, it was basically just another front of their bloody war. The true extent of French involvement is absolutely staggering. Not only did 
did they provide the vast majority of naval support, but they also provided training and let the Americans borrow experts to help them out. They also supplied the Americans with the bulk of their ammunition, uniforms, boots, weapons, and pretty much everything else that you need to fight a war. Many Americans find it a bit uncomfortable to admit, but without the French, the fledgling colonies would have probably had little chance at all. Well, ben Oh. Benjamin Franklin is revered in American history. He may actually not get enough credit here. It was his meetings with the French which yep. sealed the full support of the French government. Number six. And John Adams was over there too, but it really was primarily about Benjamin Franklin. And he, he, he they're right. He does not get enough credit for the absolutely essential role he played in that. But I would not go so far as to call it basically a proxy war. Yes, French support was absolutely essential to victory. But the Americans were doing stuff on their own, too. The French support only comes because of things like the Battle of Saratoga, which was the Americans doing it on their own. That convinced the French to come in and support when they were kind of still on the fence about it a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, while it's true the French support was essential to victory, I wouldn't call it only a proxy war. It was a war for independence that could not have succeeded without a ton of help from the French. Six. American Indians fought for the British and provided excellent guerrilla warfare. True. One of the most enduring myths of the American Revolution is that Americans relied on guerrilla warfare to win, being mostly farmers who knew their land really, really well. Even some in Britain today believe this myth, but it isn't really grounded in any facts. To start with, this was a time period when guerrilla warfare in general was kind of difficult, as the latest popular weapons were actually pretty inaccurate and extremely slow to reload, which could make ambush and hit and run tactics very difficult to implement properly. This does not mean that these tactics were not used at all, but when they were, the British had plenty of experience with the tactic and had Native American allies who knew the land even better than the colonists. They also used weapons like bows and arrows that were much better for guerrilla warfare than muskets. With their use of allied Native American forces, it is likely that the British actually had a bit of an edge when it came to these kinds of sneaky tactics. The Native Americans, for those who did not know of their alliance with the British, joined voluntarily because they saw the British as being kinder to them than the colonists. Laws made and enforced by the British Crown made it harder for the colonists to take Native American lands away, so the natives saw the British troops as natural allies. Number five. Yeah, so while the revolution's going on, there is almost like this second war going on that's on the Western front, so to speak, of all of this, on the frontier. And uh, a lot of people you'll see that when they talk about their service, they say they were Indian scouts. And what that meant was basically they were on the frontier kind of helping to keep Native American attacks in check. Places like upstate New York, places like western Pennsylvania, uh, what became eastern Kentucky. Uh, these were places where there was a lot of fighting that was going on. There were incursions by Native Americans. And so there were groups of militia, American militia, patriot militia, we could call them, uh, that were kind of keeping an eye on things on that side. And one of the last major battles of the revolution takes place the following year after the Battle of Yorktown and the Siege of Yorktown and the Surrender, where everybody thinks that's what ended the war. The Battle of Blue Licks, Kentucky. Uh, my sixth great-grandfather died in that battle, as did one of Daniel Boone's sons. Daniel Boone was there in that battle. And it was mostly American patriot militia against Native Americans at Blue Licks, which is a... Uh, it's it's kind of in the northern part of Kentucky, uh, not real far from Lexington and Louisville. It's in that general part of the state. Um, but you can go see the Blue Licks battlefield today. If no taxation without representation really only applied to rich white landowners. The most famous reason for the American Revolution is that well-known line, no taxation without representation. The argument was that it was unfair for the British to heavily tax the Americans when they didn't have proper representation in Parliament based on their value to the British Crown and their size. This was really the main basis for the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution at large, but as we mentioned, most common folk didn't see very much reason to be excited about joining after the initial euphoria over 
for freedom. The reason most people weren't particularly enthralled by this idea is that the Founding Fathers really were only looking to get more rights for the citizens who already basically had a vote in the colonies to begin with. For starters, this was a time when women couldn't vote anyway, the colonies were at war with the natives, and black people were enslaved. On top of that, to vote, you were also expected to own land in almost yeah. all of the colonies, even if you contributed significantly to your local economy in some other way. After the war, almost all the colonies started to realize the hypocrisy, and eventually it changed state by state so that any free adult male who paid taxes could vote. Suffrage for various other groups would, of course, come, but much later. Number yeah, that's all true, um, but I, I don't think that that's a huge myth. I think most people understand that at that point in history, rich white landowners were the ones who had all the rights, had the property rights, had the, the voting rights. And, and that was true in England as well, um, in in Great Britain and then later in the UK. It's only in the, the middle part of the 19th century that you start to see the vote given to more and more people. Before, Americans consider the founders Christian, but many were deists or masons. Yeah. The founders are perhaps most beloved of all among the Christian right in America. This is actually kind of strange, because if they had a truly accurate picture of these men's beliefs, they may not find them so endearing. Many of the founders called themselves Christian, but if you read their writings and philosophies, many sound more agnostic. There were also a lot of openly deist thinkers among the Founding Fathers. The idea of deism is essentially that God created the universe and then stepped out of the way and only gets involved on a largely cosmic scale. So essentially, he's not going to step in and make a tornado or prevent someone from dying from malaria. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Some thinkers today believe that deism is hardly any different from many forms of atheism. Indeed, it is possible that back in the day this was simply a way for an atheist to fit into society in a way that they could still explain their beliefs. They could affirm to others that they did believe in a just and a loving God, but that that God didn't intervene in petty human affairs. This could it could also be because many of the Founding Fathers were high-level Masons, and it has been speculated by many historians that these Masonic connections may have been what helped Benjamin Franklin set up his most important diplomatic meetings in France to begin with. To be a Mason, you still had to be a Christian of some kind, yeah. although not a Catholic, so deism may have been a mushy way to ingratiate yourself enough with the Masons in order to join them, even though you only wanted in for the Brotherhood and the power, not for the religion that you didn't necessarily believe in Number yeah so uh that's true and you'll see a lot of references to providence with a capital p uh and the idea of the providence of god is um at least kind of the way i've always defined it is uh, this is god using natural order of things to provide uh that he doesn't intervene supernaturally uh, so a lot of these deists, they would say they believed in God. They believed in creation that God, like he said, God kind of got things going and then stepped back and that he you know, doesn't really intervene in the individual affairs of men. But at the same time, then you read these same many of these guys who we would probably argue are deists regularly calling for people to pray uh, and, and offering prayers of their own. And so it's, it's kind of a. A strange thing to understand because if you don't believe that God intervenes in that way, what are you praying for? So, uh, but yeah, it's absolutely true that uh, evangelical Christians today, of whom I am one, um, I think we vastly overstate the nature of the beliefs of many of the founding fathers. Now, many of them were absolutely strong Christians in their belief, um, but many certainly were not. Number three, King George III did not put extra taxes on the colonies just to be a big meanie. King George III is infamous in the USA as the evil tax-levying king who unfairly tried to tax the American people into oblivion without even offering them representation in Parliament. Most Americans don't really know much about this point in history and assume that this guy was just a ruthless tyrant who wanted to take their money and give them nothing in return. However, the truth is that, as is often the case with history, things were a good bit more complicated yep. than many have been led to believe. Just a few years prior to the beginning of the serious tit-for-tat over increasing taxes, the 
British were fresh off barely winning the Seven Years' War. For those who aren't too familiar, it was a so-called all-continent and all-world power encompassing war that many historians now refer to as World War Zero. Mm -hmm. The two years that led up to the actual declaration of war started with quite a lot of skirmishes in the Americas, which was the beginnings of what Americans now know as the French and Indian War. Yep. However, Americans tend to be a bit insular in their thinking, and most don't know that once the war truly got into full swing and all other declarations of war were official, the French and Indian War was just one of many bloody fronts all around the world. And yep. especially during the lead up to the full war, the British spent a lot of money and resources in the Americas during the Seven Years' War to protect the colonies, so they thought it would only be fair that the colonies help shoulder the economic losses from that protracted Reasonable. conflict. Number two, many of yeah, that's all true. And honestly, I think we got to remember that by the 1770s, England is moving, not England, Great Britain, and then the UK. Once you get into the 1800s, um, is moving much more toward the uh, system we understand today of a constitutional monarchy. They're not fully there yet, but they're in that direction. Uh, and so, King George the Third, sure, but. Honestly, Lord North, the prime minister, uh, is much more to blame for all this stuff. And again, is there really anyone to blame? It's perfectly reasonable for the British government to have wanted to levy some of these taxes to try and recoup some of the costs involved. And uh, I really don't see the problem with it. The most famous revolutionary heroes are embellished or simply did not exist at all. The American Revolution is as much myth and legend now as anything else, and many of those myths are based on almost complete and utter fabrications. Two of the most famous legends involve that of Paul Revere and Molly Pitcher. Molly Pitcher was a woman who was allegedly bringing water to the troops, and she saw her husband die and took his place at the cannon despite having no training, and she soon tore into the enemy troops. Some accounts even say that she got medals for it. Paul Revere's story, of course, is well known. He rode off on his horse to Concord to warn the colonists that the British were coming and successfully saved the day. However, the truth is that nearly all of that is untrue. To start with, Molly Pitcher was likely not even a real person at all. Despite historians' best efforts, they have been unable to find any evidence that a woman by that name even existed in all first-hand accounts. The only stories about Molly Pitcher were written about 100 years later, which makes them rather suspect as factual stories. There are a handful of first-hand accounts of women getting involved in battle during the Revolution, but none of them match her story. As for Paul Revere... I'm going to stop there before we get through the whole thing so I can break down each one of these. I'm going to disagree a little bit. Was there a person named Molly Pitcher? No. There absolutely are people who did that sort of thing, as he kind of alluded to th there. Uh, and the idea that it only came about 100 years later, I'm going to push back on that, too, because I know for a fact that's not true, because I know of newspaper articles about my own fifth great-grandmother, uh, whose name was Elizabeth Stillwagon, uh, for whom, when she was in the 1830s and 1840s and was up near 100 years old, there were newspaper articles saying that she was Molly Pitcher. So this is 60, 70 years after the revolution. People were obviously familiar enough with the Molly Pitcher story that when the news stories ran and said Elizabeth Stillwagon is the one that Molly Pitcher is based on, they didn't explain who Molly Pitcher was. The, the assumption from the newspaper articles is that everybody already knows that story and they're trying to explain who she really was. And so so I, I disagree that it took 100 years for that to start showing up. It was obviously something that people were already aware of. Elizabeth Stillwagon's husband, uh, Peter Stillwagon, my fifth great grandfather, was a member of the Monmouth County Militia from New Jersey. Uh, spent nearly two years in the Sugar House prison in New York after he had been captured. And uh, there are stories in the pension files of their house being burned down and, and Elizabeth having to go to live with the wife and family of uh, General Foreman and uh, all these incredible descriptions of things uh, about how she was involved in all of this. She ended up dying. The newspaper article in 1855 when she died said that she was 115. She was more likely about 106, 107. Uh, but her death was reported all throughout the whole country. Uh, so it absolutely was a story people were familiar with, and I think it's absolutely based on real people, just not somebody whose name was Molly Pitcher. 
He did ride his horse in an attempt to warn the colonists that the British were coming, but he was one of many. Indeed, he was one of 40 people who rode to warn the resistance. Indeed, as a matter of fact, he wasn't the most effective messenger either, as he was temporarily waylaid yep. by the British, and the one to reach Concord first was another person called Samuel Prescott. Number one. So again, I disagree with the headline of that. He's saying that they're embellished or they didn't exist at all. What Paul Revere did is absolutely true. He just wasn't by himself. There were lots of other people who did it too. And he didn't say the British were coming. It was most likely he said the regulars are out. The regulars are out or the regulars are coming because everybody was British at that point. But he absolutely did make the ride. He just wasn't the only one. He was, however, the most famous person of all of that. Uh, he was well known to the colonists. And so it made sense that they would use his name. The Revolutionary War did not actually end officially even after the surrender at Yorktown. True. It was a historic day. On October the 19th, 1781, the colonists, with the help of France, had won their independence from Great Britain. The British General Cornwallis had surrendered at Yorktown to George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette, and the colonist fighters couldn't be happier. Most Americans today think of it as the end of the war and the beginning of freedom from the crown. But the actual war didn't end until 1783. The truth is that while Cornwallis had the right to surrender his troops and army to a certain extent, he didn't have the authority to permanently halt all conflict between the fledgling United States and Great Britain. Indeed, that power lay with King George III. The king was reluctant to first completely cease hostilities and did not withdraw his men or order an end to the war. It wasn't until the Treaty of Paris in 1783 that the war officially ended. Even then, British soldiers didn't hear about it for a while because news traveled really slowly back in the day. For this reason, there was a solid two years of fighting, especially in the early American South, between the British soldiers and the fledgling colonies. There were also lots of naval skirmishes as well, since the king had not yet called for his navy to cease hostilities against the colonies. The king did not want to end the war at first, even though it had been a huge failure for Great Britain. Indeed, he even considered abdicating his throne because he could not keep the colonies mm. under British rule. So I really Yeah, so a couple of things about that. Number one, Cornwallis was an army commander. Uh, he was not even the overall commander in uh, North America. That was uh, General Clinton, uh, who should have been coming to Cornwallis' aid and didn't. Uh, so Cornwallis surrenders. And uh, what that did, though, is that really was kind of the last straw for public support and support in Parliament for the war. At that point, the British government didn't want to keep spending money on it. They didn't want to keep sending troops for it and really major hostilities did end was there fighting yes you got guys like john lawrence who was the son of one of the uh, presidents of the continental congress who gets killed after yorktown uh, and he had been at yorktown he was one of the commissioners who helped negotiate the terms of surrender so he's killed later in south carolina there is fighting the battle of blue licks kentucky was in 1782 uh, the british occupy new york city the largest and most important city in uh, the colonies at that point until 1783. So yeah, until that treaty is uh, ratified and word comes back, it's not over. So I hope you learned something maybe you didn't know before. If there's something else you want to add to the conversation, use the comment section below and let me know. And if you have another one of the top tens videos you think I should be checking out, let me know that as well. And I'll be glad to do that. Thanks for watching.